So Michelle Hayslett, I'm very excited to have her with us again. She is our census uh, guru. Uh, Michelle is the data services librarian at UNC Chapel Hill, where she has worked for, the, for 10 years. Um, prior to that, she worked in similar capacities at the NCSU libraries and the State Library of North Carolina. She has been learning about census data since 2000 and continues to learn. Um, so thank you very much, Michelle, and uh, you can go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have an agenda, and I will apologize in advance. This is a ton of material, and I'm going to have to go really quickly to fit it all in. I did take screenshots of everything, so I wouldn't have to fuss with trading into different applications. And there's pointers on each screen to point out the things that I really need to point out. So hopefully that part will go quickly. But it's also beneficial to you to have screenshots in there in case I don't finish everything. So uh, I do have slides scattered throughout to prompt people to ask questions. And like Linda said, you can just chat them to us and Linda will prompt me when there's questions coming in. So do ask questions as you think of them. Uh, don't hold on to them to the end because you'll forget. All right, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about American Fact Finder and then move to the tools that are available that have aggregate data. Um, I'm, I'm really going to focus on the tools for aggregate data. I'm not going to talk about the tools that are available for microdata, but there is bonus material at the end of my presentation that addresses those microdata tools. So if you're interested in that, there is at least some information there. I did not do screenshots, though, for the microdata tools. Um, these are the tools I'm going to cover, NHGIS, Social Explorer, Simply Analytics, and Policy Map. And most of these tools have multiple data sets in them. I'm going to focus on population data. And although all of the commercial sources have the ability to map data, I'm not going to address the mapping components of those products. I'm only going to talk about the data. And yes, we will send out the PowerPoint after the session. So uh, I believe it'll be linked from the Help Webinars homepage, and uh, you can get it in your email as well. So first, the bad news. You really do have to know something about the census data to be able to pull it from any of these uh, resources. Oh, Linda is reminding me that I should also mention the recording on the YouTube channel will also have a link to the PowerPoint slides. <clears throat> so census data is just complicated and there's no way around the fact that if your data collection is complicated, then the way the data are presented is going to be complicated. So the more you know about the census, the easier any of these tools will be for you to use. I'm not going to talk about census methodology much, but we just did a help, well, just did. We did a help session about the census methodology back in 2013. And so I refer you to that session if you want to learn more about the methodology overall. I am starting with American Fact Finder because sometimes it is the right tool to use. So bear that in mind. I, I have to admit I have a little bit of a bias towards American Fact Finder because it's the tool that I've used the longest and um, probably because I understand its limitations pretty well. So I'm going to try to uh, explain to you its limitations and its strengths and, and do that for all of these tools so that you have a better sense of what's best to use when. I highly recommend playing around with the tools. Uh, the more you use them, the easier they become to use. And you can't break them. So if you play around with them, you'll be able to see um, what you can and can't do with them. So I did these 
<coughs> excuse me, comparison tables to give you a quick snapshot about the tools. I'm not going to dwell on these tables. I'm just going to point them out to you. Um, I do, on, in this table, rate the ease of use. That is completely my own opinion. And if you get used to using a different tool, it's very likely that you will disagree with my <laughs> ratings. So bear that in mind. Um, there are additional elements in this table uh, to give you a comparison amongst them all. Uh, these are notes that go with the tables. I'll skip over that. Okay, so American Fact Finder. It is the Census Bureau's official online database. The Census Bureau's mission is really to focus on collecting the current data. And so they do not keep older data. If you're looking for historical data, American Fact Finder is not going to be the place to find it. We'll look, talk about that in the next slide a little bit more. It does have the strength of having all of the tables that they produce and all of the geographies that they use. Uh, some of the other tools really focus on just the most commonly used geographies and variables. And so if you need something unusual and all you need is the current data, then American Fact Finder is a good place to go. It's not exactly user-friendly. But I think that once you understand how the interface works, it goes a lot easier. And I think that's true of all of these tools. So uh, you can see what you think after we go through some of the screenshots. American Backfinder does have a 30-minute timeout, but let me back up. 30-minute timeout. And that means that if you are trying to download a lot of data, it will probably time out on you. But they do have something called the Download Center where you can you create bigger downloads, all of the blocks in the country, uh, all of the census block groups in the country, that kind of thing, or many, many, many variables. Uh, the Census Bureau doesn't have a lot of confidence in block group level data from the American Community Survey. They really make it difficult to find. And particularly from the start of the American Community Survey, the first block group data produced were in the 2005 to 2009 five-year data set. Um, they did not make those data available in American Fact Finder pretty much because they weren't great quality. The sample size really wasn't big enough to make those reliable data. So the first time that block group data is available in American Fact Finder is 2013. Uh, you kind of have to use the five-year summary files for block group data because that is the largest sample size as opposed to the one-year data. and uh, so the smallest geographies, like plot groups, only show up in the five-year data. If you, were, if you are a regular attendee of these sessions, you may have uh, heard me talk in, last June about data.census.gov. Um, I haven't heard anything about the progress they're making in transitioning American Fact Finder over to data.census.gov. But that transition is supposed to be happening like now. Between now and 2020, uh, American Fact Finder will be going away. So there's that. So these are the records management rules under which the Census Bureau operates. They only keep two of the decennial censuses, the current and one prior. For the economic census, which runs every five years, they keep the same, the current and one prior. With all of their annual surveys, their rule is usually the current and four prior, but because the American Community Survey has a five-year rolling sample, they keep uh, the current and five prior. So there's always one year, one year summary files available that's outside the current sample. 
Okay, so this is what American Pathfinder looks like when you first come to it. Um, I tend to use the advanced search, but if you're not very familiar with it, the guided search may work better for you. The download setter is just below that for the big data downloads. When you enter in the advanced search, this is what you see. Uh, if you have a particular topic or table name in mind and a particular geography, a uh, particular larger geography, you can input them here in the middle of the screen. But otherwise, you can start with any of these blue buttons over on the left side. Um, topics includes not only topics about people, but also about economic um, topics and uh, topics from other surveys like the American Housing Survey and uh, the Survey of Governments. Uh, I think that Census of Governments. You can do them in any order. Uh, you do have to choose a topic and a geography. And when you get to the list of tables that match your selections here, then you will uh, be able to select from different years in that final table screen. I'll show you that in just a sec. Oh, well, here it is. So you see over here under the data set listing, on the right, there are all tables here from 2017, but there's lots of pages here. And as you page further into it, you can get to earlier years. There are also ways under the topics screen to limit the years there if you want to do it there, too. As you make selections with the blue buttons or up here, uh, with this search, then those selections always show up in this box at the upper left so that you'll be able to see what you have. The mistake that I see people make most often with many of these tools is that you try to select everything at once. If you do that, you're not going to find any tables in this list. The tables that show up here are only those that match all of the criteria that you've selected. And so uh, if you put in race and income and education, there aren't going to be any tables that match those criteria. So you'll just have a blank screen here. So if you ever encounter that where you have a blank screen, back off some of your criteria and uh, take a look at, at what else is available. Um, in the same way, sometimes you'll see tables that start with an S. All of these tables start with a B, which in this case stands for base tables. S tables are subject tables that often cover multiple variables. And it's possible that you would put in a bunch of variables in your selections and then only be able to see subject tables because um, those would be the only ones that include all of those variables. Um, if you want to see information about what's in each table, you can click on the table title to just go ahead and go to the table. You can also click on the I to get a table shell. It doesn't have any data in the table. It just tells you how the table is excuse me, constructed. So you can go directly to a, an individual table here, or you can use the checkboxes to select multiple tables and use this download option right next to the red down arrow uh, that I put on top of this to show, show you the table titles uh, and download the data directly from there. The National Historical Geographic Information System was created by the University of Minnesota Population Center. Uh, I don't know if you know, but there are population centers at universities across the country. And the University of Minnesota Population Center really focuses on making 
a wide variety of data available. They have a lot of tools. Uh, and there are at least two, maybe three, other of their tools in the microdata section, the bonus material at the end of the presentation. National Historical GIS is the tool that focuses on aggregate data. Most of the data sets that they make available are microdata. So the difference between aggregate data and microdata Aggregate data focuses on summarizing data for an area. So you'd be talking about maybe a town, maybe a county, a state, or smaller administrative geographies like a census tract, a block group, or a census block. They're going to give you a single number that describes, say, the total population for that place, whatever it is. With microdata, you're not looking at data at any kind of summarized level. You're looking at the individual responses for whatever area you're looking at. You might still be looking at a place or, uh, I'm sorry, a town or an administrative geography, but what you're getting are all of the responses that were collected for that area. The thing about the NHGIS that's special, there's two things really. One is it's the first place that census data back to the first census in 1790 was available, uh, were available actually because data is plural. Um, so that, that historical range is exceptional. There are only a couple of sources that do that, and this is the only one of them that's free. The other thing that it does is, if you notice that GIS part of its name, it really is oriented towards providing data for mapping purposes. Um, any kind of system that does GIS mapping, you can export files from the NHGIS to use in those kinds of programs. Um, it might be the software from ESRI, like ArcMap, or it might be an open source mapping software. Uh, but if that uh, program uses shapefiles, you can export shapefiles from NHGIS. The thing that this, the, the implication of that that kind of has a negative effect for many users is that because it's adapted for exporting a lot of data, it doesn't, it doesn't work at all to generate a single number. So if what you really wanted was the population by race for a single county, you're not going to be able to get that. It's going to generate all of the counties in the country. So it's kind of a blunt instrument that way. You do have to register to use NHGIS, but it's free and you create your own login. Uh, I think that the Minnesota Population Center uses that information to measure their impact. Most of their funding is grant funding. And so they have to show their impact back to their funding agency. Uh, accounts are renewed on an annual basis. They try to emphasize with people that you shouldn't try to identify individuals from these data. You shouldn't use these data for commercial purposes. Um, it's a research database. The interface is not entirely intuitive. But just like American Fact Finder, the more you use it, the more it makes sense. Uh, you still do need to know a lot about the census. And the fact that it has historical data can be challenging in this way, because the Census Bureau has made different choices about how to organize the data over time. And so in 1980, the census tracts are in a slightly hidden place, 
compared to other years. Um, the good thing is that their documentation is excellent. They have a user forum that can answer lots of questions. And their staff are available. If you run into something you've never seen before and the user forum can't help you, the staff are very responsive to email. I've never had them lag more than a few hours uh, when I've been trying to get an answer to a question. It's an asynchronous system, which means that if you are asking for a lot of data, like every census block group in the country, they're not going to process your query as soon as you submit it. They're going to wait to process that when there's not as much demand for their system. So it might be that it runs at 3 AM. And a, a, pro, a query like that that is asking for a lot of data might get actually answered uh, or completed, rather, the next day. They'll send you an email when your file is ready to download. And uh, it'll have a link in it to get you back to the place to download it. So here's the screen that you get when you go to nhgis.org. Uh, links for all of these tools are in the slides. I will point out a couple things here. First, this is where you log in. Uh, you can do a fair amount of poking around in the interface without having to log in. But if you're going to download, uh, well, not even if you're going to download data, um, if you're going to actually submit a query, you have to eventually log in. And it'll prompt you if you don't. Here's where you find their FAQs and help documentation. And then to actually get into the system, you either select data or get data. Both of those take you to the same place. And as long as we're on the screen, I'm also going to point out my data. Um, my data is where you log in to retrieve your files once they've finished processing your query. So uh, I'm, I point that out now because we'll come back to it after I run you through a search. So I clicked on Login, and this is where you get the registration form. I wanted you to see the kinds of things they ask for on the registration form. There's a quirk about their general research statement. They require that you enter at least 50 words here. And if you are able to describe your use of the system in less than 50 words, that's perfectly fine. They see this all the time. I don't know why they keep this requirement here. But then you can just fill in the rest of the 50 words with gibberish and lots of spaces. Uh, OK, so this is the interface. <laughs> it seems a little bare bones. Uh, but it's the same kind of, so you can start with any of these green buttons to add the criteria, just like you did in American Fact Finder. Um, it doesn't matter where you start. You can do it in any order. I started with geography. So you see that the default is to give you the most popular ones, but you can switch to others of these categories if they better match what you're trying to do. Uh, if you click on one of the plus buttons, uh, that's what actually selects something. If you click on the title, that will tell you which years those geographies are available for. So that can be useful information if you're not sure what you're going for. Uh, and again, it'll pull all of those geographies for the whole country. Uh, it doesn't give you an option to just pull specific areas. So then once you've made your selection here, you click Submit. And uh, you get a screen similar to Fact Finders, where it lists tables that match your selections up here. Uh, once you start choosing topics, uh, those will 
show up up here in the data cart on the right. Notice what I've selected so far is just counties, and there are 330, excuse me, 33,984 possible tables that have county level data. So the tables in this list match the selections up here. Uh, same thing, if you started selecting multiple variables up here, uh, I, I often use race, income, education, because I just know there aren't any tables that do that, then you would get no tables down here. So then you could just delete some of your variables and uh, back out to see what's really available. So there's still things that I don't fully understand about NHGIS. Um, they do have these table topic filters. And when you're selecting your topics to begin with, the ones in this outer column are the ones you want to focus on. There are breakdown filters available, apparently, for some things. But for instance, I chose race and then further down tried to choose income. I know that there are some race tables that cross tab with income, but it left me with no table options. So uh, it's not always the breakdown filters, even when they're available, don't always apply for what you're doing. Um, it might be that I had, because I was selecting county level, that's why the race and income cross tab wasn't available. It might be that that cross tab is only available for larger geographies. But so you see here the selection screen for topics and the one for years. Um, it will gray out things where it doesn't match the selections you've already made. So now that I've selected counties, years, topics, I have a list of tables that are available for what I want to do. I will point out, um, again, the more you know about a given part of the census, the more this is going to make sense to you. The thing that stands out to me here is having chosen 2008 to 2010, I know that this is American Community Survey data, and it's three-year data. Um, the three-year data sets don't exist anymore. They cut those for budget reasons. But just the fact that it is a multi-year summary file tells me that it's American Community Survey data. This box, I wanted to point out that there are three different kinds of tables that you can choose from. Uh, the greatest number, of course, are in source tables. But NHGIS has created some time series tables with the most common, uh, the most basic counts, the most basic variables. So uh, in this case, there is not a time series table that matches my selections up here, uh, but you will see time series tables available. I think that NHGIS, there's three products, there's only three products that offer time series data, and NHGIS has the best, most thorough methodology for that. Uh, so I do recommend them if you're needing to use census data as a time series study. Uh, and then the GIS files are available there as well. You do the same thing here of selecting a variable by clicking the plus button, and then that shows up in your data cart up here. When you're ready, when you have all the things that you need, you click continue up here to continue. And then you get a screen like this. Um, there's, this screen just gives you a chance to uh, change some of your options. It, it shows you that you've only selected one table 
and you have one of 23 available geographic levels. So if you wanted to add more geographies here, you could do it here. Um, mostly I just click through it to the next screen. So on the next screen, it gives you some options for changing the structure of the output that you get. If you need to use this in a GIS package, you could choose common delimited, the default. But if you needed to use it in a statistical package, a fixed width format is going to work better for you. So you could change that. You can also combine uh, files into a single data file or keep them in separate files depending on what your needs are. I point out the description regularly because if you use NHGIS with any regularity, you get a long list of your queries at the end of the process. And the description is the only way you're going to be able to tell them apart from one another. Um, you'll see when we get to the end, I have a, not a long list, but uh, a list of my queries. And I've only done descriptions for a few of them. So it's pretty easy for that to get out of hand if you use this very much at all. Oh, so here it is. This is the extract history page that you get to when you finish your query. And you'll see that it shows your most recent one as being in progress. And then when it's finished, you get a complete message. And uh, there will be a link in one of these two columns for you to actually download your data. Um, apparently, I did some uh, exporting of teen data for a patron named Tom. I don't even remember what that was about. Um, wasn't that long ago either. Here, I, I did ask um, the University of Minnesota Population Center staff, is it possible to clear out this list? And what they told me is, no, <laughs> there is no way to clear your list. Um, what happens with this is there aren't any links in the table now because they only hold the download file for a couple of weeks. So you have some time to get to it. But then after two weeks, it goes away. And they maintain this list in order that you can resubmit your query if you find that maybe you trashed that data and a year later you need it again, you don't have to reconstruct the query. You can just resubmit it. Uh, once you have an email that says your data query is ready, you can follow that link or you can come back to the NHGIS page and click on that My Data link so that um, that will take you back to the same page. So we had a question come in um, a little bit later about American Fact Finder. <laughs> so okay. Go okay. Back there. Um, it was, uh, and Jenny might need to type in to explain a little bit more, but she was asking basically whether or not the search was Boolean style in the American Fact Finder search. If the search is Boolean style, yes, it is Boolean style. Um, I don't know if you can insert ORs. I don't. I don't think it really works that way. I think they're only using and. So uh, there's that. And then the question that we just got about New England places, those are a specific category of geography for the Census Bureau. And so you will find New England places as their own thing. It's um, what they call them as geographic summary levels. And so there is a specific summary level for New England places. Other questions? Oh, um, Jenny meant cross-tabbing, I think. She, she typed again in here. Oh, you mean for the Boolean for, question? Yeah, for it. Yeah. Cross-tabbing. OK, so what happens with cross-tabbing is that there are standards for how much data the Census Bureau can release without breaching confidentiality. They are required by law to protect confidentiality. And there are both fines and jail terms if you breach confidentiality. 
So the Census Bureau is serious about not putting it too much data out there. Okay. Uh, still, I think that that's a good question. Um, you won't find, you will find three, maybe even four variables cross-tabbed in a given table, but you're not going to find any more than that. Um, at that point, you're going to want to switch to the microdata to get custom cross-tabulations. Okay, Social Explorer. It has a very user-friendly interface. It is the other tool that I'm willing to recommend for uh, time series data. Um, it's, it has a user-friendly way to do it. Uh, the third tool is the longitudinal track database from Brown, and that's much harder to use. So I, I do recommend Social Explorer for that, and I don't think I noted that it has time series data. Um, they do occasionally use tabs in their interface, so that can be tricky. It does have the full history back to 1790. It's commercial. Uh, it does have a little bit of free data on their website, so you can take a look at that. Um, it does say it has all the data for all the years, but they do tend to focus on the most commonly used things. And it does have separate interfaces for maps versus tables. The maps interface has fewer variables than the tables one. Um, it's just not easy to map everything. It does have some nice options in mapping for comparisons. So once you, you do have to create an account with Social Explorer even when you have a subscription. And this is the dashboard that it puts you on once you log in. So you choose either maps or reports. Uh, reports is the interface that you use for generating tables. When you go to my reports, it says you don't have any yet. So then you click on create report to create one. And then it's a drill down system. So you select the data file that you're interested in using. I think I went with ACF five-year data. Once you choose it, uh, it opens up a detailed window so you can choose the year that you need. Then it puts you into a drill down system for the geographies. So uh, nation is the default, but it has a hierarchical system. So the indents show you how the geographies run. Counties are, of course, uh, subsumed under states. So when I choose county, then it offers me the chance to choose a particular state. It also lets me choose if I want all counties in the country or just all counties in the state of North Carolina. Or you can choose individual or multiple counties down here. Um, once you've chosen them, once you've highlighted them, you have to add them to put them in what you can barely see there is the current geography selections. Oh. So I chose all counties in North Carolina and added it to my selections. And then you click Proceed to Tables to go on to the variable selection. The list tables is the default. I find that the search by keyword is often uh, more efficient when you know the terminology that you're trying to use. OK, so then. Uh, it does the same thing after you add it to your selections. Then it says something like proceed to data or proceed to results. And within here, you see, again, the tab selection. Here's just a viewing area for the tables. And you only get five geographies at a time. But you could switch to Excel or data download for statistical package formats to download all of the data. Uh, and here are some of the formats available for the data download. Tab delimited. Um, you could include all of the geographic identifiers if you're combining this table into a GIS project. Uh, you can do CSV. You can do 
uh, set of tables for SAS or SPSS. Questions on that? All right, I'm going to buzz right ahead. Uh, keep, keep questions coming. I have to cover Simply Analytics because it's available to North Carolina folks through NC Live. I feel like it's my least favorite of these tools. It's a complicated interface, and they put data in there that I don't think they should put in there. Um, I'll explain that in a minute. The more you use it, the easier it's going to get. And they do have good uh, introduction videos and documentation to help you use the interface. It focuses on the most current data. The only uh, the furthest back the historical data goes is 1980. It is commercial. Um, if you're not in North Carolina, you would have to probably get a trial to see the interface. Uh, but there might be some some introductory material on their commercial website. It is mainly oriented towards maps, but once you create a map, you can export the tables behind it. This is what I'm talking about, the data that I think should not be in there. So the Census Bureau produces data down to the Census Block Group level with the American Community Survey, specifically because the sample size is not large enough to create uh, estimates for any smaller geography than that. And like I said, they're not very confident in the block group level data. And yet, Simply Analytics publishes census block level data for the American Community Survey. And I just object to that. It seems to me that there is no way those data can be reliable and because this is a commercial product, they don't tell you anything about their methodology for creating those estimates. So they're in there, and there's no good indicator for the fact that they aren't data that are readily available, not just readily available, they're not available at all from the Census Bureau. Um, so. It, they do list the source, but I am always cautious about sending new data users to this tool specifically for that reason. It does have a lot more than just census data. Um, they get data from a lot of different sources. And so if you need to combine data, if you need data that goes beyond census data, uh, it is a good resource for that. And they have some features like radius searches. So this is the screen that I get when I go to it as a subscription. Uh, we access it through NC Live, but we, as a university, have also purchased some additional uh, modules. So I'm not sure that this would look exactly the same if you were going through it just through NC Live. You can use either your own account that you create or sign in as an anonymous guest. But if you sign in as a guest, then you will not be able to save your work. So over here on the right is where they have their documentation. Over here on the left is where you make your selections. The data tab is the default, and so you can see right off all the different kinds of data that they have there. If I go to population, then I get a more specific list to choose from. And if I choose one of these variables, then I get a more specific list yet. Uh, this is where it tells you the source of the data. It's really easy to miss that because it's kind of grayed out. But it, it's also hyperlinked so that if you click on it, it will give you more metadata about that source and how, like what uh, survey it was collected with. So uh, let me go back to that last slide. 
Oh, uh, the other thing is that the year selection is down at the bottom of this detailed list. So sometimes people have a hard time finding the years because it's not a separate tab up here. It's kind of buried down in the data selection. If you change to locations, you can uh, do a variety of things here. There's a search box in this black uh, rectangle where you can search for named places. When you hover over it, it gives you this note that you can search for all these different kinds of geographies. The search does not work for the census administrative geographies, tracts and block groups. Um, but you can zoom in, like if you searched for Charlotte, which is what I did, then you can zoom in to see the tract level data. Um, but then you kind of have to know where the census tract is that you're looking for. So it's uh, kind of difficult to use if you're looking for a specific tract and you don't know where it is. Uh, so this is my map of Charlotte. Uh, note that it automatically goes to a zip code level, but you can change that if you wanted to switch to one of these others. I am sorry to say that the red color is the default and wow, I have a hard time looking at that every time I go to this. But you can edit that over here. You can change both the color scheme and the ranges that it displays the data in. So uh, there is some ability to moderate that glare. If you wanted to switch to the comparison table here, that is how you would get to the part where you can export the table. Uh, edit, I highlight the edit button and the comparison table again. So when I click on comparison table, this is what I get, just the simple table. And then if you go to export, that's where uh, you get to uh, be able to, to export in different formats. They have Excel and CSV and that kind of thing. So now if you switch to the businesses, uh, you can look at uh, industry categories, either by SIC or NAICS. I chose retail trade and got then a more specific list. And if I went to grocery stores, there's two different ways, two different categories of stores to look at. So that if you wanted to look at food deserts, you could use this information to do that. Um, the thing is, it doesn't display these on the map. It just gives you a list of the businesses that are in that industry category. So you would have to pretty much export this again as a table uh, to use that outside of the system. Uh, and this is reached by clicking on this businesses button down here. Okay, questions on that? Flying through this, we only have eight left. How you would Oh, I missed that question. Linda, could you read it back to me? Yeah, sorry. I'm wondering, wondering how you would compare, for example, with Simply Analytics, some of the other tools the census produces, such as um, Census Business Builder uh, on the map. Yeah, so uh, I can't really address that question within the context of this webinar. I'm, I'm really focusing on the population data here partly because my expertise is really not in the economic data. So maybe we can have another webinar about that and recruit somebody else to do that webinar. All right, the last tool is PolicyNAP. Um, this is another tool that focuses on mapping. I think it's a pretty easy interface, uh, but it does take some orientation. It's hard to tell where the census data are, kind of like simply analytics. Uh, it doesn't make it very obvious what the source is. It also focuses on mostly the current data. The history is only back to 2000. And again, it's commercial. Uh, you'd probably have to request a trial. You can export tables for the most part from this, but they source some of their data from third-party vendors. And so if the vendor 
only licenses their data, then they're not going to let you export those data tables. Um, there is a way to get to a list of their sources where you can kind of figure out that it's a third source, third party source. Uh, but you should email me if you want to know how to do that because it's a little complicated to explain. There is a wide variety of data in here, all of it oriented towards public policy issues. And you can upload your own data to map it together with the data that policy map includes. So that's kind of a nice feature. Um, it does have a feature called three layer maps, and those can be a little tricky to figure out. Another thing that I don't mention here in the slide, it has both point data and layer data. So if you're familiar with GIS mapping, you know that sometimes you're going to map the specific addresses of say, a business or a hospital. Uh, and sometimes you're going to look at boundaries, like uh, city boundaries. And sometimes you can do point data for places that have boundaries. So instead of doing boundaries for a city, you might only have a point on the map for where a city is located if you're looking at it from a uh, high level, like satellite kind of view. Um, you're not going to be able to see the boundaries anyway. You're just going to see the point location. So if you're familiar with mapping, then you're going to notice the difference between the point boundaries, the point locations, and the layers within this tool. But if you're not familiar with mapping, you're never going to see those distinctions. So this is what it looks when you go to their website. You can search for a location here and a topic here, or you can zoom to a location on the map and select different variables up here. Uh, pointing some of this out. Uploaded data is where you could load your own data. And then this is where you get your topics. So I went to demographics and then to race and got this more specific list. And then when I chose Asian, I got all of these different categories of specific kinds of Asian origin. So I chose Vietnamese. They go with a default purple uh, color scheme, which at least is not so bad as the red for people who are colorblind. But still maybe not my first choice. Um, it shows you the data layer you selected over here, and the source is right there, teeny tiny letters. Uh, again, if you click on that link, it will take you to more metadata about the source. You can change your options somewhat in the legend uh, by selecting a different year, by changing the colors or the ranges. So it's pretty intuitive that way. And then up here, there's a citing link so that if you exported this to use in a report, you could just copy the suggested citation to go in your bibliography. OK, I made it. That's all of the material that I had hoped to cover today. And if you have questions, uh, we still have a couple minutes if you want to pipe in and let me know what they are. There is another slide in here somewhere that does race by town. OK, so I hate to say it, Jenny, but that's an impossible question, <laughs> um, at least for the time being. There is. It is still true that NHGIS and Social Explorer, even though they go back to 1790, they don't have all of the data that's available. And those earlier years of the census, 
still have pretty limited sub-county level data. So I think NHGIS only has place data back to 1970. So if, in, if you wanted race data in 1790, that's available down to the county level. But so far, it's not possible to get place level data um, back to 1790. All of these tools are still being worked on. They're still loading more data as they process it. It's just that it's such a massive amount of data, it's going to take a long time before they're actually complete. There is another slide somewhere, it might be out of place, where I summarized, I would recommend this database for this use. Um, I did include a slide about on the map in the bonus material, so there's a little bit of information about that there. Um, and there's different kinds of reports that you can generate from on the map. So these are the kinds of things that you can do with that. Oh, here's the summary slide. So American Fact Finder is best for current, complete variables and geographies, and so forth. Uh, to, again, give you more information along with those tables to compare what the strengths and weaknesses of the different resources are. Other questions? We had a question about the individual historical census. Um, the actual enumeration forms? Yeah, so that's, um, and that would be Heritage Quest is the main one we use here. I don't know if other people in Ancestry have heard, and we don't have access to it, but. Yeah, we had Ancestry for a while because we helped them with newspaper content, but we don't have it any longer. I believe our public library does, uh, and that's not through NC Live. That's just a database that our public library decided to subscribe to. So you might check with your local public library and see if they have options. The enumeration forms are released 72 years after a census is taken. So as far as I know, uh, 1940 is the most recent that's out. Yeah, 1940. And um, Heritage Quest is through NC Live if you are North Carolina. Oh, that's good to know. Um, and that, yeah, that's a great resource. I think it's owned by Ancestry.com right now. Um, but if you can get it, I think it's cheaper than Ancestry. Um, but we get it through NC Live in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for this. This has been a really great overview and the, um, of some of these sources. And for, in, for Minnesota Population Center, there's a webinar that we did um, in 2016, I think, where they go, it actually, Minnesota Population Center did a webinar on their products, and so they go into, um, all the different things besides just NHJIS, which is a wonderful, wonderful product, it has saved my life many times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for doing this, and just uh, see if there's any more questions or. Well, I'm happy to help. I'm I'm glad that uh, this was helpful to you. And if you have questions about the census, uh, you're welcome to email me. If I can help, I'm happy to give you quick pointers may not be able to do something in depth depending on what time of the semester it is, but uh, I am happy to point you in the right direction. 